challenges that I've encountered and uh, some of the opportunities that hopefully will uh, be of, of value. Um, just in terms of, of getting a gauge, um, the people here, um, all of you have had a chance to at least scan the, the, the Startup Society's um, ebook or take a look at the slides which, which I forwarded. Some will have read some the book, know, some, some will yes. be new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we might as well. And then we're, we're also live streaming this. So we might as well kind of give more of a general introduction um, for people who haven't read anything. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction now. So, uh, hey, everyone. Um, today we have a Q&A with Mark Fraser, who is the chairman of the um, Startup Societies Foundation. And he's the president of Open World, which is a nonprofit network specializing in finding ways to remove barriers to entrepreneurship. He has worked in over 50 countries in the past three decades on special economic zones and market-based learning initiatives. He is the author of Founding Startup Societies, which is an ebook on new ways to bootstrap eco-villages and tiny house communities. And um, he's also active in the Game B space, um, mainly around incubating contract-based communities with a focus on land trusts and endowment zones that vest residents as beneficiaries of uh, rising land values. So some very interesting um, subjects for us to discuss today. Uh, I think, Mark, you're going to do a little bit of a, a presentation for us and talk a little bit about things of, that have... Um, uh, been happening, especially since this pandemic, and uh, you know the interest in tiny house communities and eco villages is at a definitely at a high point right now. So I think a lot of people would love to hear from you uh, in your experience. Well, great, thank you. I, I've been um, admiring the, the initiatives uh, that are in the kind of greater Game B um, circle, smart villages. Uh, very much among them. And um, to, in terms of, of giving a, a, a context for how I got into some, um, you know, some of these waters, I began about four decades ago to look to uh, see how rule sets, um, the governance uh, of, of, um, of communities could be done in a much more experimental uh, way than the traditional bureaucracies let things happen. Uh, so I, early in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, there were projects to create uh, new countries, um, which were based on contractual consent uh, systems um, instead of top-down control. Um, and I, I admired them a lot. I, I you know, thought, how cool is this? Um, but I also saw firsthand how um, countries that had these entrepreneurs coming in and saying, oh, <laughs> may we create a new country, um, really got their hat handed to them. And it, it, there was a, a lot of, uh, um, of learning, I think, um, about this approach. Oh, we've got something cool. Obviously, people will want it. So when I saw that that, that approach didn't work, I began to think instead of pushing on a string, basically going to an area that um, a polity that you know had a lot of problems um, and saying, you know, let us solve them, um, could be in instead of of that dynamic, it could be turned around and there could be a prize to be won. Uh, so with, uh, um, in, in the mid-70s, with uh, help from Arthur C. Clarke and Bucky Fuller um, and a number of, of fairly well-known folks uh, beyond that, um, we hit on the idea of creating a competition for places to give land and give deep policy reform in order to be um, chosen as the site for a um, equatorial uh, space launch uh, venture um, we called Earthport. And boy, did that, we were operating on a shoestring, but um, within, within about six months of assembling a luminous uh, group, uh, we had a, a, a dozen um, countries saying, yes, 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 we want to be the site of this um, international 
uh, Freeport for opening space. Uh, and that left a deep impression. Um, unfortunately, the State Department did not particularly um, see that in a favorable way. Um, and so after that experience of seeing how ready um, political uh, institutions were to go a long way in reforms and, and providing land grants um, in return for getting something that would be um, extraordinarily interesting, prestigious, and beneficial to their citizens through land rent. Um, I did some homework on, uh, on Hong Kong and Singapore, which are cases of very free places, free economies, or at least then, um, that were able to keep social ownership of land. And the land rents are, are in a, a, a big, big source of revenue. So uh, then to skip forward, um, I, having uh, not fared uh, the way we wished with the Earthport project, I began a consulting group and worked on the, the first generation of information uh, technology zones um, in a consulting role. And then as uh, the 90s uh, and came along and the impact of the internet was clear, uh, began to get involved in ways that the these free areas could um, become nodes of uh, demonopolized telecommunication links, deregulated links, um, making it possible for the, the, the locations to access um, opportunities in virtual markets and online learning resources. Um, and because I, I come from the left, um, even though I, I'm very um, free market oriented as well, um, I, I was looking for how can we get this model of level field um, policy reform areas uh, to accelerate um, opportunities for people who are very much um, left out of the, the mainstream. Um, and, and so I became um, active in projects to do micro scholarships and, and uh, micro vouchers uh, that were funded with land grant commitments by, by very poor communities. Um, in Sri Lanka and Kyrgyzstan, there um, you know, were ultimately, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, close to 10,000 of these little uh, entry-level scholarships for people to get learning online. Um, and so that essentially um, is what drew me to, to Game B in 2013. Uh, Jordan and Jim Rott um, began to pull together their, their meetings. And um, I looked with a lot of interest and engagement to see how this model of using land rent, uh, ground lease rent, um, could be a way to reward the initiators of the uh, these experimental communities um, and also to have the communities surrounding them uh, benefit from the uplift in, in land values when you have trustworthy um, open systems. Uh, the land values may jump fivefold, tenfold, fifteenfold. Um, the Game B project then kind of got in a tangle um, over um, you know number of, of uh, issues, um, basically a schism between the people who want to go political versus people who were much more focused on civil society and cultural shift. Um, and then uh, in, in 2017, I was invited to uh, become chair of a brand new group, a bootstrap group called the Startup Societies Foundation. And it is um, a big tent uh, approach. Um, again, looking to provide uh, strategies and, and uh, resources, um, how-to resources for bootstrap entrepreneurs. And I uh, delved into eco-villages. I've worked with tiny house uh, community startup projects and am active now um, in a business way uh, with a um, Airbnb uh, community uh, called the White Lotus Eco Spa, 
uh, retreat where we're using innovative um, you know, building systems um, in the context of creating a convivial community. Um, it's done very well on Airbnb, uh, like, you know, now thousands of, of, um, of, of people have raided this cluster of 12 Airbnbs, um, you know, five-star um, ratings. And uh, we, I, I'm kind of at, at this um, turning point now with the emergence of the Proto B incubator, uh, looking to see how the ideas that we mapped out in the 600 page uh, Startup Societies Foundation book on omni wins, on success sharing, um, entrepreneurial initiatives that don't create enclaves, but create um, very profitable, but very inclusive and very extensible, scalable um, models for uh, bringing about the kind of changes that um, I think all of us uh, feel um, should be and can be the next, the next um, jump for uh, humankind. So I, I'm honored to be in, in the conversation with you and would love to explore any uh, specific issues that you may have as you come at this. Um, and we'll try to take whatever my white hair has uh, gotten in the way of learning experiences and, and, and share um, what I think the opportunities are. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's maybe jump into the slides if you'd like to do that right now. And then Tyson's going to be collecting questions from both the Zoom chat and the YouTube live stream. And then we can just jump into that. He'll call on people in, in, within the Zoom call to ask you those questions. Um, Good. Um, could I ask, since I, I'm not um, myself uh, gotten, I don't have, I have the slides or a link to the slides. Um, but would it be possible for somebody who's better at, in terms of the uh, doing the um, coordination of the slides and the video, um, if I could ask them to pull up a a link right now? I'll I'll put. Oh, I just opened the chat file. Wait one sec. Um, hey, Tyson, I think we'll do that here. Um, but you've also got to watch watch the chat, so I can do it, Tyson, if you want. Good. Uh, so here's. Oh. oh, you've got the, okay, great. You've got it. I had already done it. Do you want me to, do you want me to hand it to you, Mike, or? Um, um, you're good to go, I think. Cool. Good. Okay, so this, this was a presentation um, that, that I did, uh, adapted from the Startup Society's Foundation a year earlier, um, at this uh, White Lotus Eco Spa Retreat in, uh, in Virginia, near the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and basically, I am now trying to, yeah. Um, we're, we're, I think at, at a time where we're being propelled by, <laughs> by um, a lot of uh, uh, pressures, but also pulled by by the imaginal, um, you know, the, the various visions we have for what ideal places are, and for me at least, uh, they're places that that are self-organizing, that are linked to. Uh, very bold, transformative kind of epic adventures um, that have the qualities of being very convivial um, and uh, high trust um, that are healthy for the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. And stand by just one sec. Um, that offer security as, um, as systems fray, fray um, and at, that includes economic security. So uh, just to to go to the next slide, um, the, these are the points we'll, we'll cover, um, but the, the experience of free zones, when I started off, it was kind of naively as in classical liberal fashion, um, thinking, oh, we just have to get get these barriers removed and everything will be fine. And for quite a while, if we go to the next slide, um, the approach uh, did work. It, um, it, there, there was kind of a pork barrel dynamic going 
where countries that were um, suffocated in bureaucracy and over regulation and high taxes and corruption um, welcomed the idea not of changing their whole system overnight, but of setting up pilot areas. And so um, I did uh, find because um, the projects I worked on did have the element of, of a, a kind of cool, um, you know, new technology, um, the information technology especially, uh, there, there was a, an openness, a willingness to experiment with deep reform. Um, and then once one area had a successful technology part, then it would set off this ripple of desire on the part of other um, adjacent countries or nearby regions to do the same. And at that point, the cost for getting into the setting up these info, infotech uh, free zones was about five US million to 20 million. But as I mentioned, um, as telecommunication uh, markets freed up, the cost kept coming down and down to the point where um, pilot projects in very small areas became feasible. So the early recipe was to, to go to countries and say, you know, you are looking for jobs and investment, you know, moving up skills. Um, and all you have to do is basically do what Singapore or Hong Kong did, but on a smaller scale. And, um, and then uh, <laughs> in would come the data processing operations, secretarial service bureaus and, and so forth. Um, that worked great for decades. And um, I began to see about uh, 20 years ago that maybe it won't work so well um, in the future. And that's largely because uh, we're entering now the exponential um, era and uh, the tendency of marginal costs to drop to next to nothing. Um, and a much more personalized rather than massive factory model for services and industry um, that also people as they, um, as technologies advanced uh, became more awakened to the need for, for balance and quality of life. So that um, brought, brings us to the next uh, slide. Possibly, okay. Uh, yeah, it, it was <laughs> the the old labor intensive approach to, to creating these alternative uh, community, these experimental zones. Um, it became harder to make the case that, you know, you should do this because lots of jobs will flow. Um, we are, I think, more and more going to head to a future that um, is taking drudge and toil and, and having bots do it. Uh, and that makes it hard for, for political folks to get all excited about experimental areas if you know it's essentially not going to map to the traditional uh, job creation that they're looking for. So then we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, just again, to the point of, of how uh, many industries we've taken for granted are, are going to be um, highly automated, including construction, transportation, and so forth. Um, that as these old mainstays for employment um, uh, dimmed, the, uh, there was a rise of, um, of online markets for gig work. Um, so in, in the 90s, I began um, uh, doing little micro uh, outsourcing projects globally, uh, transcription and graphic design and so forth, um, just to get kind of the, the hang of it. And um, back then there were 300,000 uh, freelancers uh, or less than that even in the early 90s when this started. Um, but by the year 2000, the leading online market had, had 300,000 freelancers. Today, that's 40 million. And the, the, the troubling thing for people in many cases is one, um, 
they are reverse auction markets in many of these online marketplaces, which means with an influx of, of millions of, of hungry um, uh, folks looking to earn reputation, they essentially bid down the, the price of the gigs to almost nothing. There's a, I, I had one transcription project um, I outsourced uh, a World Bank um, uh, video one hour. It would have cost in, in 1998, it would have cost um, $100 for an onshore person to, to transcribe that. I got a bid for $1 from an offshore entrepreneur who had no reputation, but was so eager um, you know, to do for a dollar just to get, they had done a project for the World Bank on their um, their reputation and reference um, profile. So um, we're now with the telecom costs um, uh, dropping by many orders of magnitude, we're, we're seeing this essential threat, um, in, if one wants to look at it that way, um, of, of an influx of people who are going to make the cost of services um, that we once were highly compensated for become um, more and more tenuous uh, in terms of making your, your career on that. So um, Peter Diamandis and Steve Kotler, um, I'm sure it's known to all, all of you, uh, they, they have made the case that this, uh, this confluence of technology um, uh, leaps and and the emergence of these um, reverse auction markets and other market things um, will lead us into what they call technological socialism. And essentially that is, I think, where the game B, proto Bs and um, you know, projects of the sort that uh, I trust many of you are looking at it will become possible for once scarce um, goods and services to be radically abundant in the areas that remove the bar barriers to, to these uh, trends. Um, so uh, that takes us, I think, next to um, an alternative, which we're feeling already this torrential change in, um, in, in the game A. Um, uh, institutions and economies, and there's a lot of reaction, a lot of let's put up fences. But the I think the future is going to go um, with greatest promise and reward to those places that that essentially follow what John Robb has called um, the recipe for bot enabled Edens, and that is to relocalize production in of the physical things. Um, and to virtualize everything else. So this, I think, model makes it uh, possible to, um, to, to start very small, do inspiring changes. And then um, if we go to the next slide, uh, I think, yeah, uh, that people who are, are finding fewer and fewer options in game A will be looking to turn to the this new generation of, of game B, you know, or next or success sharing um, startup communities that offer as club goods, basically uh, a whole set of um, things that were once very difficult to struggle to get um, and lets people self-organize around what they feel their calling is and what their learning quests are. Um, so this experience economy, largely demonetized and dematerialized, um, it is, I, I sense, going to, to become more and more um, the, the best path forward uh, for, for projects that are, are, are land-based, um, physically grounded. Um, communities. So we can go to the next one. Um, the, the key point here is that the land values um, in these areas that, that make the, the, the best moves 
um, into this next economy are going to rise. And uh, land values are, are pretty, pretty cool um, as we're moving to a relationship uh, rich um, uh, area that has um, a wealth of, of, um, of resources and, um, and co-creation opportunities that even though these are, are kind of intangible or de dematerialized, the land itself that offers this as a bundle or as a package becomes more and more valuable. Um, essentially everything that's done to, to lower the cost of leading a, a, a great life um, increases the demand um, for people as they want to come in. Um, the cost of entering that community in terms of leaseholds or um, you know, land tenure, that gets bid up in proportion to how much better this new area is relative to this, this failing surrounding area. Um, so here's the opportunity and the danger. The opportunity is that bringing these, these game B like um, innovations in a concentrated way will allow for people who are in the early phases to benefit enormously, but um, it has a potential to be a, an enclave. And unless there are on ramps and ways for, for people of all uh, backgrounds and all um, starting positions to, to vest in, to see paths to come in and participate as peers, um, I think there's going to be a political backlash. Um, so two, two areas that I've, I've been particularly uh, interested in are eco villages and tiny house communities. Um, I'm quite sure um, all this is familiar ground, but eco villages are um, making moves, uh, not, you know, it's uh, still a big learning process, but to to bring uh, kindred spirits together in ways that allow the relationships to, to, to flourish and uh, to reconnect in gro very grounded ways with, um, with life as um, we would like it to be. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the tiny house community movement starting after the 20, 2008 financial collapse um, people realized that they, <laughs> there was an alternative to, um, to being trapped in underwater mortgages. And so there's been a growth of, uh, of, of these communities that in the jurisdictions that allow for people to live in their uh, tiny houses on wheels year round. Um, and, and there are more and more of those now. Um, they're, they're able to come together in, um, in much more affordable ways of living. And the beauty of many of these tiny house uh, ventures is that if it's not working in one particular setting, people don't feel trapped. You know, they can reconfigure and uh, either within a, a larger uh, tiny house community move to a different neighborhood or um, choose to, to hit the road. Um, and a precursor of, of uh, this hitting the road, um, there's a group of RVers um, with about 60,000 members called escapees um, who coordinate their vacations. Um, and they've been doing this for you know, decades now. Um, they decide, oh, let's go to, these, um, to this place this summer together with their friends. Um, and out of this has grown a, a set of co-op owned um, RV parks, uh, about a dozen of them now. Um, and it, it points, I think, to another trend, which is, is uh, people um, who are opting out of game A um, are looking to t test the waters or check out different locations. Um, th this is another um, on-ramp to tiny house communities that, that 
people can check it out, live together um, for a period. And then if it works, you know, settle in and, um, and, and set up a co-op uh, th that actually owns the, the, um, the community. Um, these are two uh, projects in North Carolina. One is a recreational village. It's actually built on a shoreline, the, the, the one below the coral, uh, uh, coral sands um, has a, they're all on wheels. So if the, the reservoir water levels get too high, they, they just winch, winch their uh, RVs <laughs> or tiny houses on wheels out of, out of the way. Um, so there are chances to, to, um, to create these villages and areas that um, normally would not be possible to do um, with traditional uh, constraints. Um, shopping malls also turning in now, in some cases, to tiny house villages. Well, the, the, there are three areas of, of revenue potential that, um, that I've been especially interested in. One is the short stay rental, um, the VRBO, Airbnb kind of model. And this is, um, th these are just vignettes from, uh, from Portland, Oregon and various uh, tiny house or Airbnb uh, Airstream rentals, but there, these are th these can start generating money um, right away. It's a quick start um, option. Um, another way that communities are bootstrapping um, with with funding is through offering learning experiences. There is a project in, called Kalu Yala in uh, Panama, which essentially has been bootstrapped and built by uh, students um, from around the world who come uh, into the Panamanian rainforest in this privately held um, area and uh, are, are, are learning by doing. They're making their, their own eco-village um, as, as short-termers. But these properties then generate income from um, through crowdfunding um, uh, purchase or leaseholds and Airbnb like um, short stay rentals. So that um, there's a hunger, particularly as people uh, try, try to figure out how do we shift from game A to game B to be able to come to locations offering Airbnb like uh, rentals, but also experiences. Airbnb has bundled in what they call Airbnb experiences. So the people who um, wish to uh, have workshops while they're staying in, in this setting, uh, they, can, they can learn permaculture, you know, get intros to permaculture. Here's how to set up a microgrid or here are our new building um, innovations that you can get hands-on experience with. So that's a second um, very doable uh, revenue stream. Um, and a third is actually going back to a, um, an innovation that was pioneered um, in Josiah Warren's um, Cincinnati Time Store, he called it. And what you're looking at here is a flex conversion, personal currency note. And the way it works is essentially um, it, it can even be launched like a gift certificate uh, just to start building uh, the, the system. Um, I, I may be really good at raking leaves uh, and I, I could offer that as um, a, a kind of micro uh, contribution or um, maybe my uh, hand push lawnmower, which I'm not particularly needing anymore. Um, I could give people the option of redeeming this, um, this uh, personally issued currency note uh, for whatever I've got in abundance in the way of, um, of, of a service or skill and um, something tangible and let the recipient choose. Um, and if we go next to how it might work in the, in the um, 
era of cell phones and facial recognition and so forth, uh, if people were to um, look to opt out of the traditional monetary economy, they could, I think, um, conceivably make similar offers, asks and offers um, on a flex conversion basis. Like um, I can offer, you know, a night or two in, in an Airbnb that I own. Um, or if you'd prefer, I, I can spend a, a day or whatever unit it is um, of research time. And that gives, creates an interesting uh, dynamic that um, to take a moment, uh, the, the uh, Chris Cook, who's probably known to uh, some of you, has come up with the notion of um, land-based currencies, uh, which are essentially issued by startup communities uh, or existing communities that say, you can come here for X number of days or hours or years um, and be able to access the baseline club goods, the, these, this package of, of things that are increasingly um, abundant, or you can access the time of the person that um, wishes to have something that's useful for, for, um, for others, for value exchange, uh, trading, market um, activities. So if, if a community is set up with a land-based currency, um, something even like RCI points, which give you options for, for stays in various um, resort properties, you can have that uh, as one of the flex conversion options. But the second is the community also can, can prosper by making the time-based personal currencies that are part of the other flex option, increasingly in demand, increasingly valuable. And the communities that do best in, in building the skills and networking um, people uh, in productive ways will be able to move then into uh, potentially quite high va value um, offerings, both of the stay in the community and of the of the services of the residents um, who care to issue their own flex conversion uh, system. So uh, that's that's a, a dynamic which I, has, to my knowledge, not been tried yet with with cell phone um, systems. But but it is a, another prospect for bootstrapping um, the next economy um, in in a, a very micro way, but one that has synergies with, with the community. Um, so next one, uh, yeah, we're, I think, in a pretty brittle time. And uh, as and when the there's a new shock, another 2008 or worse, perhaps, um, uh, convulsion, lots of sites are going to become, um, they'll be tax forfeited. Uh, or people will will um, walk away from mortgages, and the banks will be holding huge amounts. And this, I think, makes it possible for um, for proto B communities based on land trusts and what uh, Zachary Casaris has called endowment zones to come in um, essentially and say we can make things um, in communities that are prepared to offer these properties on a leasehold basis and, and essentially next to no upfront cost, um, we, we can bring life into areas that are, are gasping um, now. And that could be through crowd moves, meaning people who are pre-pledging to say, if an area 
does provide these kind of land trust um, partnerships and does agree to, to lift a lot of the barriers that are holding back the, the, this next um, economy, then we will commit at least to spend, you know, a week um, in the Airbnb mode or potentially longer term stays to help bring um, the, this new kind of community into being. Uh, and that, uh, my, my sense is that, that that will be far more attractive to gay may failing communities um, than, than just trying to, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, so if we go to the next one, Uh, the endowment zones are basically community land trusts with a, a, a very deep um, policy change that has the effect of, uh, of lifting the, the, the asset value of the land. Um, and again, this goes back to the, the early model, which I was working on uh, greenfield sites, a cow pasture in Uruguay that I worked on in uh, 1990, 92, um, rose um, <laughs> in, in that period um, you know, by 10, 15 fold in value. And it was a function of, of a probably the best um, business climate reforms, pro-entrepreneur, pro-investment reforms in the whole, in the whole continent. Uh, so, those are explicit taxes and ex, you know, explicit regulations, but those aren't the only kind of, of reforms um, I think that we'll see in, the, um, in, in this next generation. But the bottom line is the, um, the revenue gains as long as the land is held in trust as a lease, uh, on a leasehold basis, um, the revenues can flow back to the stakeholders, including residents of the startup community and in varying um, on-ramps to those outside for them to become vested uh, with shares in, in this enormous awakening of, of the value of, of the land. And so Hong Kong, Singapore, Macau all hold land socially owned, um, 80% in Singapore practically 100% in Hong Kong and, and Macau. And so they're, they're making billions each year off of land, land rent, land leases. Um, and that on a small scale um, is also you know, doable if one creates a, a breakthrough um, area um, to make this fate, the state jump um, out, of, out of game A. Um, so what kind of reforms? Uh, the governance uh, systems on the blockchain or hollow chain, um, you know, utterly uh, transparent, level field, uh, removal of barriers to personal enterprise. And these unfortunately are not co-op uh, platforms, but, um, but they're, they're examples of how Productive um, energy can be released if, if, as long as you're not outlawing Airbnb and so forth. Um, tax relief for entrepreneurs and self-providing neighborhood associations. Um, the there's been a growth, a huge growth of condo and homeowner association contractual communities. Um, in 64, 1964, there were 600 of them. In North America today, there are over 350,000 of them. And um, that's despite the fact there are double payment problems where people in many of these contractual communities are paying fees for infrastructure and they're also um, in services, but they're also paying taxes. So this makes for a, um, a real barrier to, to these these kind of communities um, and in tax relief that, that would allow for self-sufficient um, communities that had positive externalities with their neighbors 
um, would, would be another sort of reform. Uh, zoning and building code barriers, huge obstacle now for, for tiny house communities, pop-up villages. Um, so getting those out of the way would uh, make a big difference. Um, innovations in transport, um, you know, drone um, deliveries and um, who knows, the flying cars or whatever comes next. Um, um, highly personalized healthcare and, um, and virtual learning, um, you know, having uh, still obstacles that are, are removable. Um, so now, uh, and then next generation R&D ventures, uh, these um, areas where people can, can try combinator combinatorial therapies um, with, without you know, many years of waiting for regulatory approval. Uh, is one example. So uh, now the question is, how do communities um, that are, 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 are feeling the hurt of, of these failures in game A, how do they, how do these alternatives uh, get on their radar? And the approach which um, I've been working on is one based on lead with a gift which is how the Phoenicians planted the first uh, free zones um, back 3,000 years ago. Egypt and, and the Hittites had kind of two superpowers had fought themselves to exhaustion, and the Medi Eastern Mediterranean was just you know ravaged economically. And so what the Phoenicians came up with was the idea of let's row our boat <laughs> around to these villages so that we. Have never met before, and as night falls, let's paddle ashore um, and and uh, put a gift on the beach, light a fire, and then you know back we go to the boat. And the next morning, when these gifts were discovered, um, one of two things would happen: the the community would say, uh, "What well, the the people would just take the the gift and leave nothing in return," but in other cases, the Phoenicians found, hey, they look, they put a gift on the beach for us. So in that case, they they um, feel bold and go you know, talk with their their new trading partners, and this is how relationships of trust and safe havens for for trade um, popped up. Ultimately, about a hundred. Um, you know, free trade outposts around around the Mediterranean. So um, today, at these this, these gifts on a beach can take a different form. They can be digital. They can be for people um, who are, you know, essentially ones who are left out of uh, of opportunities now uh, to. To get bundles of um, of e vouchers, that's how it worked in Kyrgyzstan. There were five dollar coupons that you could take to your cyber cafe and and use to get access to um, online learning opportunities or these uh, freelance marketplaces. Um, it, they can include toolkits for civic groups on how to set up land trusts and um, you know, how to remove barriers to, to investment in cooperation with the local authorities to make those valuable for shared benefit. And for government uh, bodies, how they can prosper. What Singapore does, for example, is it pegs the bonuses that civil servants receive each year to how the, um, the economy did. And if the economy did ter terribly, um, it's actually a negative bonus. Um, they call it a flexit wage. Um, but if if Singapore, as it does, uh, delivers high trust, increasingly bureaucracy-free environments, the growth of in terms of investment um, makes for a, a very attractive bonus to the point now where the civil servants in Singapore are by many measures the least corrupt in the world. And they're certainly 
the most highly compensated uh, since this system was piloted in the mid 1980s. So these kind of win-win, omni-win um, opportunities exist for for the um, politis, you know, bureaucratic and political systems uh, that that are ready to give things a try. If we shift now to the next, um, yeah, this gets way too complicated, but uh, it, essentially it's showing a scenario where leading with a gift, even a very small, small gift, um, let's say um, proto bees or a smart village um, were to offer intros to the, the opportunity, uh, including future thinkers resources where um, individuals around the world in poor areas would be offered a micro gift just to you know get them to check out um, you know the uh, an, an opening resource and maybe answer a couple of questions at, uh, after watching the the YouTube clip. Well, that's one level, but it multiplies potentially the the value of these micro scholarships grow if that one person gets some, a circle of friends together to do, do likewise. And then um, if they interact with um, local telecenters or entrepreneurial schools, um, that they can start to do um, uh, lever up even more this um, these catalytic gifts um, by by doing little work study projects. Uh, we engaged in Sri Lanka and um, in Somaliland um, by offering you know minute thirty dollar um, stipends uh, for students in 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 very distressed areas to um, you know record on their cell phone little two or three minute um, video clips about what they thought would do most to awaken uh, opportunities in their area. So as these things are uploaded, um, and it could be feedback, you know, feedback based, uh, so good, good things would, would unlock further help, you're, you're setting in motion at grassroots level a, a new awareness of the opportunities for for these startup um, villages, uh, but or community land trusts or endowment zones, experimental areas that generate revenue, and through the short-term rental Airbnb model, um, even very small areas that are doing interesting things um, can can start to generate revenue uh, without waiting, you know for years um, for things to, for this positive feedback loop to, uh, to, to happen. Um, so it goes on uh, further. I mean, uh, we would love to, to see the uh, lead with a gift um, initiative um, be offering opportunities for people uh, to connect up with uh, crowdfunding sites where they could if, if they've, again, done some starter projects well, um, earn some matching support uh, through uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter Global Giving. Um, but the, this uh, and the idea of service learning where, where people are doing virtual um, uh, micro gigs and if they're do done well, um, receive payment through these global online freelance markets where 80% of the people never get a single project. And there's immense thirst for, for, for having some global uh, references and reputation feedback visible. Um, this can, the, these service learning opportunities then can launch people um, in, into what are now closed uh, markets worth billions of dollars of untapped um, opportunity. Uh, so next, I think, um, yeah, uh, the, the one option would be essentially to, again, on the notion of pulling rather than pushing on a string, uh, to um, set up a reward or prize that recognizes um, the 
the, the, the best initiatives in terms of resonance with, with game B values and the, the self-sustaining path, um, that they would get kind of a windfall of, uh, of, of these, um, these gifts on a beach. Um, and that process, uh, I think, can accelerate the spread of, of the game B values and of, um, of, of the kind of um, market for, for replicating smart village and, and bringing in talent globally to, to help make it happen. Um, so, excuse me, I, I'm, uh, I'm blocking my, my slide with, uh, with the chat box and a few other things, but um, yeah, that, that there will be emerging entrepreneurial communities that are, are going to be doing it way better than the legacy areas, um, that these um, areas are, are differing from game A by bundling uh, abundance and, and rich opportunities for for relationship wealth, experience wealth. Um, they have the potential to federate, much like the Hanseatic um, cities of Northern Europe did, non-politically, 100 plus areas set up a thriving re re internet trade relationship um, and self-help relationship with one another um, in the Middle Ages. Uh, so as nation states get more brittle and people become less trustful of, of top-down authorities, hopefully, uh, the, the, the networking of the proto-B communities, I think will be able to do a whole lot to change the conversation uh, that we're having and that that they're anti-fragile because the worse that uh, game A gets, the the more these new areas will flourish. So I, geez, I excuse, I've just looked at the clock, but um, that's that's the essence of of um, of, of what I've been uh, you know, you know, trying to to work toward, and um, would love to to get. Your your ideas and um, ways to to improve uh, what 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 you've just heard. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I I would like to put out a question actually to you and to everybody on this call. Um, what are some low barrier to entry ways to activate existing networks and to get these kinds of projects going without spending several years and five to $20 million on setting up a free economic zone. <laughs> Starting with the easy ones. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, there, there are a lot of bootstrap ways to do it. And um, the, the, the last chapter of, of the um, founding Star society's book, looks at, at, um, at ways that this can be done um, with, with minimal uh, upfront costs. Um, one approach is there, there are places now that are giving free land to people to come, rural communities that are, are down to the last dozen or two residents and have plenty of, of properties and that um, in some cases are being given given for free if you'll make a commitment to stay. So one approach is, um, in, uh, I realize Smart Village is way beyond this phase, but um, for people who are truly bootstrapping with next to no resources, essentially to have a compact, um, you know, a group comes together of old friends or people who've known each other through social networks and really, you know, vibe well. For them to say, you know, why don't we have a a Plan B area? Uh, if our our normal life um, isn't going to be tenable. Why don't we set up a a um, a set of criteria that we can use to decide where we can make a crowd move? together, a 
pledge, basically, if it checks these boxes, um, that we will commit to at least spend a week there a year in a Airbnb kind of um, a micro project or um, build up from, from that. And uh, one of the, the, the essential messages, if, if one wants to have quality opportunities and negotiate with um, potential host areas, is to line up something that's very um, credible, practical, and inspiring, meaning it's endorsed um, by luminaries. Um, it has a set of day one value creation um, um, aspects built in for the host community itself. It might be a service learning commitment for the, you know, this, this crowd moving group to say, you know, if we find a place that meets these criteria, um, we will be prepared to do projects to add value to the community. If that means um, doing cleanup fix ups or, um, you know, planning gardens, uh, you know, in public areas, but, but something that, that shows um, the, this, the, the authentic um, success sharing values uh, and in inclusive values. That's also coupled, if you do have some luminous names of, of, of endorsers, that's coupled with virtual um, engagement so it might be a commitment on the part of um, advisors uh, in in your startup project to do a uh, seminars workshops um one-on-one -on -one, um, you know the, the small small uh, amounts at least at first but but something that 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 gives an area that's looking to get on the map a connection with some of the most um, eminent, you know, movers in a, a given field, and that could be in wellness, it could be in regenerative agriculture. Um, it, you know, there are many niches that these different projects can can go for, but delivering day one value and this um, credibility, I think, means you can lever land commitments and policy reforms. Um, and you know, through crowdfunding platforms, also to uh, to to get lined up in advance um, pledges that show the seriousness of being able to help uh, do something differently. So I don't know if that answers the the question, but uh, that that's kind of the ultimate bootstrap path, I think. I, I can share a little bit of value on this, just from the lessons we've learned over the last six months. Um, like we. Crowdfunded six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to purchase a one point three million dollar property, which doesn't need to be that big in scale. It's one hundred and seven acres, um, but for like a small group of people, you don't need that much space. We're just doing it because of the the size of this vision. Um, and it wasn't. It took some time, and we put together a landing page and and a form to kind of collect pledges from people. Um, but there are existing structures um, out there that you can um, uh, kind of distribute ownership of a, of a location like this and bring in funds. And um, then you can leverage that money that you raise through kind of crowdfunding to go get a mortgage, which is basically what we've done. Uh, when you put 50% down on a mortgage, it's a much easier. And th these kind of projects are super risky. And often we want to look for like rural locations, which banks don't really like. Um, but when you're putting down 50%, the chances of getting a mortgage are much, much higher than if you're just putting down 10%. And putting together a group like this uh, is, is not that hard because so many people facing COVID and facing kind of like job collapse and game A collapse want to jump into something like this. And, um, you know, putting together a hundred thousand to $250,000 and I'm talking in Canadian currency, uh, yep. is not that difficult for a lot of people, um, you know, might require selling a home, but, you know, coming into that, it, there's plenty of people that have money to put in, in those kind of smaller size chunks. 
There, there's a, a, a an approach um, the, in in the ebook we we call golden chairs, which is um, a way to set up what Jordan Hall has called race conditions to be early in to to the project. Um, and basically, the idea would work like this. And I, I, I'm not saying that this is um, directly relevant to your your specific site, but in terms of the way to I think amp up the the investor response and crowdfunding response is to present a a pilot that's at very small scale, but that vests the people who come in early on the quick start with part of the upsides from the phase two expansion, which might be on the order of a, let's let's say it's two acres uh, or two hectares on the the the, the quick start pilot, and that pur the purpose of that is at a low cost to to be the proof that there is a readiness to make a change in the rule sets, for example, remove the obstacles that that now hold back um, people from living in tiny house, um, uh, tiny house on wheels or um, you know, setting up um, uh, Airbnb uh, ventures. Um, so that's that micro example can be launched. But in the context of a pre-commitment by the locality or key landowners in locality to um, make a phase two on the order of 100 to 500 hectares, and ideally a phase three of you know, potentially the proportions for, for, for a new, uh, a, a next generation city in the future. So what happens is, is you demonstrate the, the credibility of the policy change in the micro area. The value of that, that second phase area lifts because it's credible now. You've got proof that the, the policy changes are, 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 are going to extend to that second area and the third. So what happens? This means that instead of going through the usual hoops of um, arranging financing for the 100 hectare project or the, the larger project, um, ultimate project, one can set up and we include a lot of templates and nuts and bolts on this. One can set up um, a system for tendering the second phase opportunity and the third phase opportunity. And this is where I think the bridging with game A capital, which is just, you know, a wash in uh, terms of you know, not figuring out uh, in, in any bridging way to the next economy. Um, they're, they're floundering, I think. Um, what this offers is a chance to have tenders or bids from the traditional real estate types uh, to, to come in and under a concession agreement, do three things. One, an upfront payment. Two is an annual revenue share off the ground, ground rent. And number three is what's called build, operate, transfer concessions. And this has been done with massive projects around the world. It's the notion that, yes, you attract the for-profit company in at its own risk to put the infrastructure in and provide whatever uh, you're looking for in the way of, of, um, of services, basic services for, for the area but the assets that it pays for and has the right to, um, to earn back uh, its investment and then a good return, the assets convey progressively over to the, 
benefit of the founders, the benefit of the residents of the surrounding community, and does so progressively, for, for example, 2% per year over a 50 year period. Um, and that's kind of a standard formula. So this, this is a way without um, loading up front um, all kinds of um, you know, <laughs> challenges to, in terms of financing a mid-size area. It's a way to essentially get the um, deep pocket investors who may have some alignment with uh, hopefully the, you know, a good alignment, but to create um, a competition for them to basically come in on a success sharing partnership that is at their risk. And over that, uh, that process, essentially uh, one can go from the, the micro quick start project to flip the concession opportunity in a way that well returns the, um, the, the initial costs and provides an ongoing revenue stream and generates an asset that conveys through the land trust to back to the benefit of the stakeholders. Um, so it's, it's not a game A um, project. So I don't know if that answers, but that, again, I, I kind of tune in to bootstrap uh, you know, scenarios as best I can. All right, we want to open it up to the people participating in the Zoom call here. So um, we'll just kind of have limited bureaucracy about how to manage questions and stuff until we need uh, to set something up. So if you have a question, just jump in right now. I do. Hey, Mark, really great to meet you. Thank you so much. This has been super rewarding to get to know you. And um, yeah, funny, startup communities um, is a term that I've been using with uh, this organization in Canada called Startup Canada. And it, you, we've built, you know, 50 startup communities in a matter of five years, but it was really only just based on game A business. Mm -hmm. And what flustered me the most was all these other things that was missing, which you just so amazingly described. And uh, so here we are again. And but but I kind of go back to this, the, the sense that, you know, cities are kind of, you know, man's greatest invention, they already exist. And it's great, we're contemplating all these, uh, these new smart villages. I mean, you did touch on the existing communities. Um, and kind of, the wealth of opportunity that's available for people to start a micro village inside of their existing community, which I think that's you know very much low hanging fruit these days. Um, we have a lot of municipalities with a gargantuous amount of land. Um, uh, most of them are land rich and cash poor. And frankly, you know, another downturn recession. I, I think we're going to see up to 25% of these municipalities go down. So, you know, how do we start? And I've got my own thought, thoughts I can share, but uh, you know, how do we start the innovation game inside of these startup existing communities to kind of build out uh, micro villages on the tiniest scale of scales? And you know, consider it the evolution of an innovation center, of which you know has uh, not been terribly innovative in in, in most of the world. Um, yeah, we got some thoughts on that. Cool. Um, yeah, I. I've um, been trying to noodle uh, you know, this idea of an in-place uh, startup society or in-place startup community. Um, and one of, one of the, um, I think, frontier opportunities is to look to um, associations of Airbnb hosts as being the, um, the the, the early movers uh, to, to make them happen. Um, and the reason I think that makes sense is that uh, through something which I wrote up a little piece on called neighborhood chairs, it's possible for Airbnb owners to um, say if they're kind of in a down slided neighborhood and, and you know one that's kind of hopeless 
<laughs> to say uh, to to the uh, you know the civic groups uh, there, um, we'd love to to see a some public art or a mural or um, you know landscaping um, things, and uh, we we'd we'd like to you know set aside a neighborhood chair of our increased revenue um, to help sustain those kind of, of, of efforts, which make a big difference uh, to, to people when they're deciding whether to come to this place or that place, you know, if, if they can see on, on the um, short-term rental site, a look, hey, this is an interesting neighborhood. It's kind of cool. Um, so that dialogue between the civic groups and the Airbnb owner or ideally cluster of owners in a given area, I think can be a way at very low risk to, to set this new dynamic going. And then if, if there's a possibility with external um, um, allies, basically to set up contests or competitions, say, you know, um, there's now going to be a, a, a reward in terms of visibility um, or maybe more for for the most exciting um, art and music festival that's uh, generated by these kind of neighborhood share partnerships or the best mural or whatever it is but that that ability to to have a um, a, a validation external you know scarce good um, can can help move the, the conversations much faster Hey, if we do, if we get our act together on this project, um, you know, we we can we can make this uh, bigger thing, this bigger recognition happen. Um, so that I think is one approach. Another is to take options on on distressed properties and share the upsides. Um, an endowment zone might vest kids, for example, um, at risk kids. Uh, in to the degree that they're they're making digitally recorded uploads on YouTube of of their pitching in to on cleanup fix up projects or or mentoring um, you know friends to do better um, that this sort of thing can vest in in uh, increased access to to the the land trust um, ongoing you know revenue. And it pays for itself because um, things that make neighborhoods safer and make them more vibrant um, boost land value. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I definitely can can concur on the whole competition and challenge format. That's something mm -hmm. you know we played in the smart cities world now in Canada. Part of an organization called Open North, and we're the technical mm -hmm. partner to the Smart Cities Challenge here, and we work with existing communities. Um, and that's a huge format for getting com uh, communities to compete on innovative solutions. I think it's going to be a wealth of opportunity. The other thing is, you know, civic engagement 101, uh, getting off social media onto a, like already built beautiful civic engagement platforms to get communities to co-create around solutions that they choose. And uh, that's, a, that's a core responsibility from all of us is to use the tech that we can now that have al that's already been built in some in their own countries off of uh, the big tech companies that you can visualize a lot better of what you know, Mark you're saying is the ability to visualize this flow of of how to get from uh, some communities are starting one way and ending up another way and then being able to network in that and I think the future thinkers were we're trying to work on different knowledge management tools with other smart villages see how we can kind of get that point across um, and then uh, the, plug it in. You, the, this uh, the big aha, um, the city, CityScope is an open source project um, at MIT, which awesome. is uh, lets people um, see in 3D um, various scenarios of it, how if we put a park here or the uh, you know, bike trail there or whatever, how, how it affects the, the flows and opportunities in the neighborhood in real time. And it's very intuitive and accessible. And um, also these uh, city simulation games 
um, SimCity, obviously, uh, but City Skyline is is, um, is one that that's just extraordinary. So I think yeah. part of the next generation of spreading these alternative, you know, pro to be communities can be to allow groups at local scale or virtual tribes to kind of create their simulations and visions of, of, of how to do these things. And that can have a huge splash uh, impact, especially if it's coupled with uh, eminent endorsers and with uh, contingent pledges, either to come and visit the community that introduces this new thing or um, to, uh, to help crowdfund or crowd move uh, in terms of bringing new energy into areas that are looking for it. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Yeah, there, there was a, one last thing. There was, um, you know, people asking me in the chat about um, communities giving up land. And, and it's very much so like the, uh, an organization that we're, we're working with, Regen Villages is approaching communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them, as, they, as, uh, as I mentioned, have an excess amount of land. So once we get our product together and we're, it's rec replicable and it's scalable, we yep. will have very much the opportunity to get oodles of land for free over time. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of land on planet Earth, so <laughs> have to get that model straight. Yeah, uh, Jordan Hall has said that um, innovation will be uh, to to this century what um, oil was, petroleum was to the last century. It will be the um, strategic thing. So, having um, projects uh, not you know undifferentiated, you know, vanilla kind of things, but but ones that are going for uh, big change, big uh, bold visions um, in you know, some cluster of, of, uh, of, of niches that are synergistic um, and showing that this can, you know, we're ready to start now. You can have the virtual tour of this and you know, the, the, these highly respected people be happy to Zoom with you on, on you know some of the questions you may have um that this this uh is within reach and also the uh, design of of the um grand parenting of, of rewards for early movers so if if there is a technology company that's prepared to offer all kinds of um you know in-kind up upfront help um that it could uh, the various consortium members um, who make these projects all the more uh, ready to to go, um, they could, in return for that, quite minuscule um, but but vital startup help, be vested in phase two and phase three, in terms of the endowment zone flow of of revenue, and maybe have first option in certain areas to provide um you know tools or solutions without lock-in uh that that's um I, I i think that race condition can apply also to uh the the folks who come into the airbnbs and in, in round one um you know they have some you know tiny but uh but actual um participation and upsides from phase two and then phase three uh, it, it, it's a, a potentially a way to front load a lot of response to to the the small proof of pilot and the pilot uh, phase project. Um, so we've just got about five minutes left here in the conversation. Does anyone else want to jump in with some questions or thoughts? Um, Mike, I'd like to. I was just starting to enter in the chat to ask if I might be able to do that, um, in part because I'm asking for permission to redirect kind of the, the trajectory, the path that with the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm looking at responsibility for initiating a, a, an eco-region of something approaching 600,000 square acres. 
Wow. Um, well, and it's it's just sitting there, <laughs> kind of kind of uh, begging or asking for for attention. But my orientation to that to this point is largely based in um, both what what would what would combine into a well-being uh, uh, index or indi indicators, but uh, sustainable de uh, development with respect to um, nine planetary boundaries in the, that with regard to Kate Rayworth's uh, model of, of economics. And I'm kind of using these large models just to, to get help people get their, their bearings um, in, you know, a, approaching what is otherwise just kind of a huge undertaking, but doing that with a community, kind of a community oriented uh, 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 approach, um, really emphasis upon uh, equity, uh, sh shared uh, participation, uh, you know, we, we all the all the way uh, game game B supplanting game game A. I I just I was looking for an opportunity just to present that and and try and invite a little bit of feedback if anybody's. I I've gotten a lot that thus far stuff that you know in, in kind of how how to what I've done to this point to a great extent I'm pretty good at is is linking or bridging uh, uh, parties and uh, relation relationships. So I see in kind of what you've presented so far, a lot of opportunity to, to, to do that. It's amazing how the, the levels transcend. I, there's an, uh, also an aspect in terms of the, um, the impact on, on, the, on the area that I think could, could be very fruitful. Um, and generate revenue. Um, it's essentially the concept of, um, of, of virtual um, residency. Uh, Estonia has e-residencies. So in addition to having in an, an eco-preserve, um, you know, some few areas of, um, for short stay visitors or learning things that aren't going to disturb the the surround, um, there could be a way for offering a, a kind of a virtual um, uh, visitor <laughs> opportunities. Um, in the Galapagos, there, there are these cameras that, you know, on these little submarines, a, a, a tiny, tiny, tiny um, things so that the kids can pilot um, from wherever they are around the world. They can steer them and they can see, oh, wow, look at this. So the, the prospect of inviting people uh, to become subscribers or members of the virtual community um, can open pathways for them, um, like their, their screensaver or whatever can, can be highlighting you know, the, the latest doings of, uh, of, of the, the wildlife there. And Chris Cook has come up with a, a model called non-dominium, which nests beautifully, I think, with uh, El Eleanor Ostrom's ideas of stewardship. Um, and, and it's also possible to do a commercial activity in a non-dominium framework. Um, and in this book uh, does, does get in to some degree to non-dominium. And I'll, I'll share, I think I've got it, uh, right handy, uh, share a link to a paper um, that, that uh, Chris has done. In fact, what I'll do is um, paste the whole set of references here. Um, I think that may be fruitful for, for the kind of projects you've described. I'm sorry, the, the, there's a muting on, on the the mic i'm not hearing any sound the the way that the project is laying out geographically that the parameters there are four four major universities that i'm looking at uh collaborating pretty much together uh with the learning 
uh, as a central component, um, uh, kind of along with the stewardship in terms of sustainability uh, and uh, happiness uh, well-being index. Cool. Cool. So we're just kind of getting to the end of our time here. Um, I, I can tell we've got a lot more questions. Um, so maybe what we could do is a little AMA within, within the community. Uh, we can do text questions and then we can put together um, a bit of a resource for people. Mm -hmm. um, that way we, we can just get, get this all out kind of quickly. Um, would you be up for that, Mark? I would be glad to. Awesome. So um, what we'll do, guys, is we'll set up a time in the next couple of weeks to do that. Uh, I know we're approaching Christmas, actually. Um, so we'll figure out what the date is. I'll put it in the community. Um, if you're not already in the community, uh, you should go to it at futurethinkers.org slash friend. Um, we do charge five bucks a month um, for it just to kind of pay for the expenses of organizing the information and the software and stuff. So, um, but you'll get three months free if you follow that link. And then what we'll do is host this conversation and then all the follow-up stuff in a post there within the community. So please go there, sign up at futurethinkers.org slash friend. And we can do this in the next couple of days. It doesn't have to be a few weeks. Well, it depends on Mark's schedule. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, can ne next week is next week is, is quite open. So awesome. awesome. Okay, we'll do that. So we'll do a text Good. AMA in the community and get Good. this. Yeah create a bit of a resource here as well. There's a wiki uh, where we're putting a lot of information um, into mm -hmm. as we kind of uh, develop this project and kind of answer our own questions. And you can go to that at futurethinkers.org slash wiki. Um, and that one should be free and, and open for anyone to check out. So there's um, tons of information already there and more being added. Cool. Um, sorry, guys, for not having more time here. This has been uh, very enlightening. I know there's a lot more we could discuss here. This, this is a big topic. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll do it again soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. I've enjoyed it and look forward to the next. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark. Yo. <laughs>